Uh, I'm going to hand over to these three extremely courageous young women who've come from Manchester and Bolton, and they're going to speak to you about their views of education. I think we'll start with you, Olivia, if that's okay. And I'll just hand over to the panel to, to respond. Thank you. So just before we start, some of you who conducted whole school assemblies know it can be quite an intimidating thing. So there's 400 teachers, three young women. Can we start by giving all three of them a huge round of applause for being here, please? And we've got Olivia, Daisy and Millie, they're, both, they're all going to speak for two or three minutes each and then we're going to get some responses and I'll talk about who's responding in a little while, but we're going to Olivia first. Hi, I'm Olivia Clark, I'm 14 years old, attending Loretto High School and I'm here today representing Reclaim as a working class girl from Manchester. Reclaim is a leadership and social change charity giving working class young people a voice in situations where their opinion may not always be valued or even acknowledged. Unlike school, Reclaim supports me to find my voice in political situations. They allow me to challenge situations that will affect my future and most importantly, engage in conversations about my opinion on society. At Reclaim, I am treated as an expert in understanding what is affecting young people and what we need most. But right now, the experts that are making decisions that affect our future are disconnected from our educational experience. Exams in general are stressful, but imagine being told that the GCSEs you will be sitting in 18 months are going to be more challenging than ever. Recently, I sat a science exam, and a week before the exam, which was based off the new grading system, something we had never faced, we were told by our teacher, papers aren't designed for young people like you. Not only did I go into the exam worried about not meeting the pass rate, I also had the words of the teacher replaying in my head. What was that opinion based on? My class? My ability? Or was it because they are stressed as they are under-resourced? This left me questioning, what was I going to do if I didn't meet the expectations of a government that I will never come face to face with? Education is supposed to set us up for life, but isn't teaching us about life. If you are unsure what I mean by this, I'm asking for an equal balance of an education that teaches us how to succeed in exams and how to succeed as an individual, not an exam number. Why is it we are still being taught the same things our grandparents were taught? I understand the facts don't change, but the fact is, society does. I want an education that inspires me to want to go to school. I want an education that allows me to leave with relevant life skills. But most of all, I want an education that teaches me the benefits of engaging in leadership and democracy and that supports me to do so, so decisions made for young people can be informed by young people. Thank you for your time. I think that was really powerful from Olivia and some challenging things in there for us to think about. You think you can't engage in politics in school and you think that the curriculum isn't equipping you for life. We're going to, after the three of you have speaken, spoken, we're going to get some responses from Emma Hardy, who is the MP for Northern Rocks, and <laughs> for, for, uh, for Ros Wilson, who tells me I should introduce her as 52 years old, fifth, sorry, 52 years in education. <laughs> and still learning because she's not getting it right yet. And so we're going to respond to you as well. And now we're going straight over to Daisy. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Daisy Bally, and I'm here to talk to you all today about my experiences in education. So education has always been very, very important to me because my parents are both teachers and were both the best in their families to go to the university. So it's rubbed off on me, so it's always been something that I found really, really important and something about I have always really enjoyed. And I've been really, really um, well supported by my school um, going through the education system. And after getting over the absolute horror of the fact that I didn't want to do a humanities subject like my parents wanted to do, uh, were teaching wanted me to do, that I actually wanted to do engineering, I was actually really, really well supported. 
um, going through and pursuing a career in engineering. Um, I wasn't really deterred by the lack of girls going into engineering. Um, I just sort of went along with it and went into my maths and physics class, um, being one of two girls in the class. Um, and actually, when I got in there, I was really, really shocked that these gender stereotypes still existed in the classroom. And people had figured out that I was really, really passionate about um, gender issues and gender equality. And that meant that I was sort of, um, by some of the, like, not all of the boys in the class, but some of the boys felt that because of that, they were making sort of sexist comments towards me, saying, like, you know, why is a girl in a physics classroom? And obviously, people just thought of it as, you know, harmless banter, but it actually hurt. And I'm quite stubborn, quite outspoken. Um, so I retorted, I spoke back to them, and um, I um, challenged these views in my responses and in just working really, really hard to prove I was an equal. Um, but some people won't speak out and won't respond uh, to these comments, and who's speaking up for them, who's giving them people a voice? Um, my head of year actually did a really, really good assembly about uh, feminism and gender equality, which was really, really inspiring. It was really well received by a lot of the girls in the year, but unfortunately, some of the boys in the year struggled with this issue. I didn't want to confront this issue. Um, so what I'm sort of trying to say to you is, please do challenge these stereotypes in the classroom and stand up for girls who are receiving these comments and allow girls to reach their full potential because we shouldn't have to prove that we belong in a classroom just because it's male dominated. So as you all know soon it'll be a hundred years since some women um, got the vote but we still have a really really long way to go until we get to gender equality because boys are assertive and confident and we as girls are bossy and controlling and we, sh we shouldn't have to deal with obstacles like these sexist attitudes in order to succeed and do what we love. So if there's one thing I'd like you to take away is to educate people about these issues and um, give a voice to the voiceless to these girls who won't speak back when people try and make these comments towards them and just think to yourself is your classroom or your school a place where these attitudes are challenged and girls are allowed to feel comfortable doing what they love and are allowed to flourish in these subjects. Thank you very much. was absolutely fantastic thank you very much and let's move straight on to Millie okay. so I'm Millie and um, as Daisy was saying earlier about education being a well-rounded experience I feel I've had a positive one at Turton and have been well taught supported and encouraged in pursuing a career in law at university however I do feel that there's three issues that still need to be addressed in state education the first is the excessive focus on examinations used to indicate the students skills and achievements Exams cause stress to most students, but some would say more so for the students under pressure to constantly achieve the highest grades, whereas others would say the less academic, who often struggle and are therefore disillusioned at an early stage. It may be that schools are actually too focused on exams and not flexible enough on creating a well-rounded experience, as Daisy earlier mentioned. But from my experience, there are many paths to success, for example, friends looking at apprenticeships, which provide openings to develop skills and abilities that are as necessary in life as grades. So this brings me to my second point. If schools and governments can be encouraged to be more flexible in allowing students to choose the right path for them, then the issue of mental health, which is on an increase across many schools, may be reduced. A positive to take from this is mental health of students is now openly being debated, with teachers recognising the need to understand students as a whole. From my own personal experience, the support I received at the stressful time of my GCSEs was invaluable, but has made me realise not all students have that option. Finally, I'm aware that many girls still feel more pressure to achieve than boys and are judged more harshly in failing to do so. Then, if they choose a certain career path, they can find they're hampered by traditionally male-dominated professions. Both Daisy and I are hoping to be successful in such careers, which is engineering and law. We can only hope that education society continues to widen opportunities for girls like us, full of enthusiasm, confidence and determination. Girls whose education has been within the state system. Thank you.
I, I think a lot of the teachers here would have welcomed lots of the things that you've said, and you'd find, if you could have been here for the whole of the day, people talking about the same issues that you're raising. We want to work with young people to, have to get the education that you want for yourselves. So, Emma, can I pass over to you? Do you want to respond to some of these comments from the young women? Oh, brilliant the three of you are that's absolutely fantastic your confidence in speaking to this group is is amazing you wow um olivia i mean obviously the work that we claim are doing must be brilliant to give you that voice and give you that confidence i mean and i agree with you about the exams being more stressful than ever and those comments on how important it is and i you know from when i was campaigning i was talking to young people who had just the exactly reason you gave who had been high achievers and they'd had to go around with um, textbooks with their expected grade stuck on the front of it which they felt was this constant level they had to achieve and then when they felt they could no longer achieve it then they crashed out of the whole system and that was from you know knocking on doors and talking to parents and talking to people about that and I think that's wrong because I was saying to one of them you know I, I went back and did um did one of my A levels again and you and it's, I've had in my life already I'm on my third career <coughs> but, you know, changes happen and changes happen to everyone and I think the message to young people we should put over as teachers is yeah exams are important but they're not everything and it's okay to get things wrong because that's what happens in life, that we get things wrong and we pick ourselves up and we get on with it. And that's more of an important lesson than to me, you know, and I, I really hope that does come across and you don't put yourselves under that much, that much pressure. Uh, and what, I mean, I was a teacher in terms of saying about the confidence, I was a primary teacher and we had a debating club and I took the kids down to Parliament and I took different schools down there, which I had a really surreal experience actually when I saw other teachers taking children around Parliament when I was actually in Parliament. That was quite bizarre this week. And I'd encourage that to go down and see how you can get involved and go down and see how you can be part of it. And, and one of the comments made by, one, uh, by somebody when I set up the debate club and my school was a comp you know, normal state school was it wasn't for schools like this. And I was like, no, I said, if there's a debate club in all the private schools, there can be a debate club in Willoughby Car Lane Primary, you know, and we should have that across the board. And your comments about uh, sexism and challenging it, yes, absolutely. And it unfortunately doesn't stop at all. And, you know, this election, this parliament, we've got the highest number of women MPs we've ever had, but it's still unrepresentative. And I think... Obviously, three of you will be up there, I'm sure, in the future, challenging that and giving that voice. And uh, congratulations to all three of you, and so delighted you're here. What about the three of you? You've got an MP there, I mean, newly elected MP. Are there any points you want to respond to in what Emma said to you? <laughs> you, can, you can think about that and come back. And Daisy, can I ask you the biggest block on, I'm a physics teacher, so yeah. I want young women in physics, but was the biggest block on you doing physics, was it the sexism boys or the humanities attitudes of your parents? <laughs> no, um, my, I, I, I joke, my parents were supportive of whatever crowd I wanted to see. They had put absolutely no pressure on me most pressure I, I could say I put on myself so whatever I wanted to do they always say just do your best and are, are there any women science teachers maths teachers in the audience so there's a, a sprinkle a good sprinkling there are people who and are there men science teachers who are encouraging women into young women into their physics classes and chemistry classes not very many of them. I was, though. <laughs> All right. So, Ros. Thank you. Um, I'm humbled. I'm truly humbled by the three of you. Uh, the way you spoke, the passion you spoke with, and most importantly, probably, the extraordinary points you made that were so relevant and uh, a good lesson for all of us. And that exactly fits with the fact that I'm still learning. Um, I showed a photograph this morning when I was talking to some of our colleagues here today 
and it was the teaching staff of a school that I joined in 1969. It, wasn't, it was my second post. And there were eight teachers in the photograph, and we played spot the head teacher. And of course, the head teacher was a man in those days, and that is nothing against the wonderful male colleagues here today, and I mean that sincerely. But in those days, and right through probably till the late 1980s, 99% of primary head teachers were men. And yet, there were so few men in primary education. The, ed, uh, the system was dominated by women as teachers and by men as school leaders. And that has changed. It's changed in what seems to me a very short time, but when you look back to uh, Emily Pankhurst, it's a very long time it's taken us to get there. And it's not until we square that circle and we have uh, people in leadership in schools, men and women, who know the value that you can bring and the damage you can do. And it's the damage that we must worry about most. The undermining of your confidence, which it sounds as though in a small way you've all experienced at times, and the helping you to believe in yourselves and to fulfill the dreams that you have expressed with such great passion. And I'm a very old lady and I don't know much, but I know you're going to do that. You're going to achieve it. So very well done. It's a privilege to have heard you. We're running out of time for this session, but I just wanted to, to ask Olivia, you're, you're engaging in politics through this Reclaim organisation. How do you think we could do more politics in schools? Well, just general conversations about our opinions on it in general and asking us when, the, asking us when there is something that happens in society that is going to affect our future. Ask us what we think about it because I feel like in school it's like a barrier and if you try and step into a conversation to do with politics then you just looked at like why are you even trying to engage in it and my age doesn't define my opinion on politics and I just feel like more conversations on it need to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I think that round of applause is because the teachers here want to be able to do that as well. We want to find the space for that. And knowing that you want that space really matters. And Millie, you talked about the focus on examinations and the, the lack of focus, with all of you really, about preparation for life. What is it that you're looking for to, pre to prepare for? What, do you, what aspects of your life do you think you should be preparing for in school? I think especially, well, at our stage, obviously not your stage, you're a bit younger, but like universities preparing for that. So maybe, for example, about student loans or applying for jobs. I know it's a long way off, but everything's so, so focused. Like for me and Daisy, we went to University of Leeds Open Day today. So everything's jumping from education to education to education. So we've got our whole like student life to learn about like the facts and the figures, but we want to be, have like a well-rounded experience as well and to grow as individuals, not just focus on exams. Fantastic. Well, I think the three of you are absolute credits to Loretto and to Turton, and thank you very much for being here. Can we give them another round of applause, please?